I usually start with sort of a, a few ideas that I'm always, a thread that's always in my work. Nature and technology, or our relationship to the natural environment, I think, and you and I have some things in common. We're both tree huggers, you know. Um, I think we all love the earth, you know. We have to, or else we wouldn't be able to survive here. It's just some of us see our responsibility in different ways, but um, these are the ideas that you can think of as a backdrop for the work, you know. Um, Kelly Scott Kelly one time, in one of her talks, she said something really profound, very simple, but she said that you can look at these pictures the way that you read a poem. So the way those words fit together in a poem, it's different than those words would, would uh, fit together in prose. Or um, we don't have to look at art and know what it means in one or two sentences. There are some pieces, you know, that of mine that, that could be boiled down to a paragraph or so, but um, if we think about those ideas, our, our relationship to the natural environment as sort of the, the backdrop to the work, the theme, or I'm making art at that idea, not necessarily about it. This gives me the chance to sort of look for connections, look for things that I can put together, make, make analogies, sort of present analogies and let them unfold. Um, Nature and technology, you know, sometimes technology follows nature. It, it sort of uses it as, as an example, like um, Velcro. You know, the, the man that invented Velcro noticed that when he was hiking, little burrs would get stuck in his clothing and in his dog's fur. So he looked really closely at those burrs and how they would stick into fabric. And he created this, this hook and loop sort of attachment. Um, other examples of technology that aren't so positive, maybe in their result, at like the internal combustion engine, you know, is it following nature as an example, or is it simply exploiting nature for our, for our own good, but ultimately we're suffering as a result of it? Um, so these are the kinds of ideas that I'm trying to put together. The, the medium that I'm working with, photographs, um, I'm trying to, bring my mixed media approach to photography. So you're looking at images that are um, com not composited. They're not Photoshop, they're not collages. They're just straight photographs that have been staged in the studio. What you're seeing, for the most part, is what was captured by the camera that day in the studio. So a lot of work goes into preparing it. There's um, projected areas, there's uh, objects, things that are painted, um, but I don't do any altering of color, I don't do any collaging or anything thing like that with the computer, it's all just a straightforward photograph. Um, so I, the, the meaning behind it has to do with the way that I'm making it. So I'm collecting these things, um, some of them have been discarded, some of it's just clutter that that you know, accumulates in my studio. I uh, told a friend of mine that my studio looks like the living room from Sanford and Son. You guys remember the sitcom? Um, he said, no, it's more like Sanford and Son meets Sesame Street. <laughs> it's accurate, okay? It's all right. Um, but televisions, you know, there are a few televisions in the pieces. Um, how many of you have ever tried to get rid of your cathode ray tube television. Yeah. You try to find someone that wants to buy it, there's no way. No one wants a, a, a cathode ray tube television anymore. They want the flat screen, you know. Um, you can't even give it away to goodwill. They don't want it. Um, so if I could take these televisions and spray paint them, you know, try to find some new use for them, create something of beauty out of them, even if Eventually, I'm going to take them to the landfill myself, too, but um, then they've served a little bit, I don't know, one more time, they've gotten another use, uh, you know, they've been used one more time for something that's hopefully positive, um, like this one. So this one doesn't have any projection into it. This is just a long exposure photograph. The TV has been turned on like snow on the screen. Uh, it's nighttime, uh, maybe a 30 second exposure. 
And in that exposure, I fire a light bulb, turn it on and off, so it lights up the, the foliage a little bit and the color of the TV. Other ones um, like that one, there was a projected image. There's a still life or this object is there in the studio on a platform and the image that you see behind is a photograph of mine that I'm projecting with a, with a, a digital projector. And then just mounting the camera on a tripod, photographing everything again, and then the result is the print that you see here in front of you. I meant to bring the um, the, action. the bug in actually, because I ran across it in my studio. It, it's you know like the size of your, your thumb maybe. Um, mm. It's actually a glow in the dark uh, bug, and I worked. Uh, you know, I probably shot 500 frames of this one, trying to get it right. I'm trying to get the glow in the dark uh, quality of it, but I just couldn't get enough uh, light on the rest of the, the scene and get the glowing after dark uh, at the same time. So. I abandoned that, that part of it and just let the daylight sort of light it up. But um, it's, you know, uh, Google is making a car that drives itself. Um, bugs are going to be here long after we're gone. Where are we in this equation? You know, we started this, uh, this march towards um, inanimate objects becoming animate. And there's this struggle, you know, are the bugs and the cars going to fight it out? We will be here long after, uh, I mean, they'll be here long after we're gone. But it's set with the backdrop of the architecture, which represents us, you know. Um, we're the only thing that creates this uh, permanent mark on the earth in the form of architecture. It has to be made by man. How did you do this? Is this a painting that you projected? Yeah, so, so there are two glass objects on two, that are placed on a painting. So the that aqua color background is, is just a painted piece of paper and the two glass objects placed onto it and then uh, with the projector I'm, I've got a photograph of a, a boat from Greece and I'm projecting into the glass it's sort of that image is lighting up on the inside of that glass and then the sharks are just little plastic sharks like that big. <laughs> so the whole thing was how big? The, the whole thing like as a still life maybe 11 by 14. I was looking for, it, since it's uh, nature and, and technology and the conversation between the two, and I was trying to see if the if you had used a human figure or, uh, and then when you said that, you know, the presence of, of humanity is the architecture, um, and I thought that th that still was more removed for me from, for me that I was still looking for the presence of that, the human figure. Right. And I was wondering, have you had the human figure in your work? I usually stay away from the human figure. Um, you know, it's difficult to paint and difficult to draw, and then when you take photographs of people, it's, it becomes something completely different than um, what I'm trying to do. You know, it becomes about that person. Who is the person? What do they look like? Um, what is their hair and skin like? You know, it's um, it, that's a kind of photography that I just don't do. I, you know, not that it shouldn't be done. I, I, you know, it's just um, I, the presence of of um, humanity is in the design, I, I guess. Um, so this piece, for example, um, it's a cast. It's a plaster cast of a violin uh, that a friend of mine gave to me. It's a beautiful object. You know, it's it's. Um, really amazing the way that the light plays off of it. And um, I, I had this photograph of a bird that had run into the window at my studio. I have giant glass windows and the bird smacked into it and, and went down to the ground. They do that all the time, you know, um, because they see the reflection and they reckon that it's um, nature that can fly through it. So I went outside and quickly took a picture of him before he woke up because when are you going to get a chance to get that close to a bird, you know? So I could get a macro shot of his feathers, her feathers, its feathers. Um, so it's a, a photograph of those feathers uh, projected onto the violin. What I found remarkable was that the lines of the feathers, when you looked really closely, they were very geometric. They almost looked like digital, um, like pixels, you know, would seem more mechanical than 
the lines of the violin, which are made by man, that had this very sinuous sort of quality to it that is meant to echo nature, you know. Um, I, I also thought of it sort of as a death mask, you know, um, because if the bird doesn't survive, you know, um, the, the old tradition of the, the Latin, the Roman death mask or plaster mask, you know. <clears throat> Thankfully that one survived, but I don't expect everyone to look at each piece and understand or be able to put it into words, you know. I, I wouldn't an anticipate that, that you could or I don't think that you necessarily should, you know. A lot of them are about our natural resources, a lot of them are about uh, turning the tables, you know, um, the natural resources here in Louisiana, there's the crawfish is in the heater back there. It's the kind of heater that a lot of you guys have, those of you that live in older houses in the garden district, you, you recognize that kind of heater. Um, and uh, there was a crawfish in my, in my yard, I'd spray the, the grass for ants, and the next day a crawfish comes crawling out of the ditch, and, and you know, like, really groggy, like looking at me like, why did you poison me, you know? And so I, I picked him up and took a photograph of him. But it's this idea of, um, you know, we're burning through our natural resources at our own expense. It's not the world that we're going to destroy, it's us that we're going to destroy, you know? Um, the, the egret and the alligator skin luggage, the, the, the luggage is my mom's luggage from the 1950s. Um, and just after that period, alligators were placed on the endangered species list. Um, and then by the 70s and 80s, they, they start to come back in numbers because of farming here in Louisiana. But you always see alligators and egrets in the swamp together. Uh, I was looking for an egret. I didn't have any e uh, egrets in my own photographs. I, I had a dove um, that I, I shot in Greece. And so I, I opened up the luggage and I put it, and I projected the dove into it, you know, like an alligator, I'm sure he'd be happy to eat a dove, you know, he'll uh, eat anything that moves, right? Um, but I wanted an egret because of, of the relationship in, in the wetlands. So I went out and I thought about Marianne Caffrey, who's unfortunately not here today, but uh, who go, she must have such patience. She goes out in a boat, I think, and photographs those egrets. Um, I was, you know, not about that, but I went out to the lakes and I um, chased a few around and <laughs> managed to capture one. So, um, I, you know, it's inspired by uh, like Egyptian funerary objects. You know, they're always um, you know, putting the, the pharaoh in the tomb with all sorts of things they're going to need in the afterlife. You know, um, the, the egret uh, hopefully makes it, but he doesn't. Um, you know, and that. The struggle, their struggle, uh, the fight between the the bug and the and the driverless car, um, turning the tables with the, the bull is on top of the tractor, um, you know, this time dominating instead of being a subject. Uh, so, uh, these are the things that I would hope would maybe unfold over time, but not aren't necessarily apparent as soon as you look at it. You know, I really enjoy the uh, dark shadows that especially in this piece, the straight, um, it's almost like a cavern to me. And the violin? It, yeah, it makes me mm -hmm. very curious as to where that cavern even leads to. Yeah. Um, and then um, the piece next to it with the, the chair and the TV and the, mm -hmm. the, the cast shadows, um, I, just, I just really like those. I think it heightens the drama too a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I had a piece in Art Melt this year that was in the last show that was here, and um, I managed to talk to one of the drawers, and she said that uh, she initially thought it was photoshopped, and that all of the drawers thought it was photoshopped. And people seem to be relieved when I tell them it's not. It's just it's been staged, and you're seeing just one frame from the camera. Um, and she said that I should make it more obvious that it's not photoshopped, and I thought that was really difficult to think, how can I make it <laughs> obvious that it's not photoshopped? Um, but, but before she had said that to me, I had been thinking about pulling back a little bit so you see more of the staged quality. So like the one in the show card, you can see more of the studio, you can see the, the electric cord where it's plugged into the wall. Um, and so I think that it's, this is sort of that idea of trying to make it look a little more theatrical, like making it look a, a little bit more like I'm staging something the way a set builder would do, you know? 